we're going to go over briefly indications, device strategies, and most importantly, um, for you to understand you know, what the aim is when you are to, talking to a patient and their caregiver um, provider, what the proposed benefit and adverse events are with LVAD therapy and understand contraindications to help guide us in terms of decision making. And so we have a, a robust team, as I uh, exemplified and talked about, we're really at the core of this is the patient um, and, and their family, and we're deciding on who's a good LVAD candidate in the context of their advanced heart failure profile. And we work with uh, perfusion and anesthesiologists and uh, coordinators to help make this work. And I mentioned our, um, our efforts in terms of seeing uh, now up to over 400 patients per year and trying to decide if they have end-stage disease um, and if so, what's the best next step? And our heart transplant donor rates here in, in the Southern United States are very good to where we have heart transplant as a real possibility. That's compared to, for example, the Northeast where um, transplant rates are, are, are lower. And so waiting for a heart transplant is a lot longer to where you have to consider keeping some patients with more overt advanced heart failure profile, consider an LVAD as, as, as a bridge. And that's different from the West Coast where heart transplants are the best you can perhaps avoid an LVAD. And so I want to put this in, into perspective, but at the end of the day, to keep it simple, those patients, whether it's in the outpatient or in the inpatient setting that are manifesting with shortness of breath at rest or with minimal exertion, failing the guideline-directed therapy that we reviewed and whom have compromised functional capacity, and we measure uh, uh, peak oxygen consumption, but you could look at six-minute walk, for example, less than 300 meters, um, in frequent hospitalization, this is a patient that we're worried about and want to uh, work up to consider LVAD uh, or transplant because the mortality uh, for, for many of these patients is in excess of 50% over the next one to two years. Now, as I mentioned, you know, heart transplant, and I can say, is still the most effective long-term strategy to treat these patients based on uh, decades and decades of experience with survivorship in excess of... Uh, 55% uh, conditional survival, if you make it outside the first 30 days, is in excess of 60% at 10 years. The challenge in our reality is that it's not um, the solution for the prevalence of heart failure, end-stage heart failure, given that there are only around 22 to 2,500 available hearts across the country um, per, per year. And so this is really where LVAD therapy has helped us uh, tremendously. Now, not only is there a donor shortage, but at institutions across the country, you'll see overlap in relative and absolute contraindications for transplant. Um, for example, advanced age, is in particularly when associated with uh, comorbidities that would pretend a poorer prognosis post-transplant, for example, over 70 with renal failure or liver dysfunction. We mandate cancer-free for five years, um, more forgiving if you have renal cancer, perhaps two years. A BMI over 35 is a contraindication at most centers for, for transplant. And uh, as Dr. Uh, uh, Kuha was mentioning, some patients develop more progressive uh, pulmonary hypertension and have a pulmonary vascular resistance above four wood, wood units. You put in a new heart, that RV is not trained and, and could fail. And so we, we, we consider that a, a contraindication for transplant. And so for these reasons, in addition to what's highlighted here in bolded and in yellow, really LVAT therapy as a bridge to transplant or as therapy in and of itself is key. And this is a data slide, but they're now um, activated over 150 um, LVAD implanting centers across the, uh, the United States and uh, over 10,000 patients uh, that are enrolled in what is for us our registry for, for VAD support, and that's been quoted here many times, uh, Intermax. And it's really based upon uh, landmark trials that put LVAD on the map that date back to 2008 for a bridge to transplant and 2010 for destination therapy. So we're now, you know, with being 2016, several years in, into this, and this is not research by, by any means. Um, and the workhorse for us, um, both in the registry and clinically uh, in terms of FDA-approved devices, is the HeartMate 2 and the Heartware HVAD. They're both continuous flow pumps. The HeartMate 2 is a uh, axial flow pump where blood comes in um, uh, along the same axis and goes to the aorta, um, propelled to the aorta. And HVAD is a centrifugal pump where blood comes in and is propelled uh, at a right axis. Um, but these account for the all the devices uh, based on uh, current Intermax registry uh, data. Now, this summarizes the current actual survival, all comers based on Intermax. And for continuous flow pumps at one year post-implant, 81%. Now, the current 
heart transplant one year survival by UNOS is around 91%. The reality is, is these patients are sicker, have more comorbidity. So I think it's unfair to compare uh, survivorship um, unless you adjust for pre-existing risk. But the survivorship has improved, especially when you look at the, the landmark trial that put LVADs on the map in the early 2000s rematch, where at two years, uh, many of these older pumps were failing based upon their historic uh, uh, design. Now, in terms of uh, trying to get someone to transplant long-term that meets criteria, we've learned from, from the United Network of Oregon sharing database um, that waitlist mortality has been dropped significantly. This was a nice exemplified in this article by uh, Dr. Stellick. And what he and his colleagues showed, and you can look at the green line at the top of this Kaplan-Meier curve, that's the current survivorship and patients listed for transplant that are status two, meaning not in the hospital requiring a balloon or on the vent or with a swan and two drips, not even on home onotropes, but ambulatory advanced heart failure patients, a, a one-year survivorship uh, in excess of, of, of uh, a little over 80 percent is, is very good. And the current LVAD uh, uh, in, in the context of bridge strategy is uh, equivalent uh, to that. And so this really has challenged the current um, system, right, in terms of in terms of allocating organs, and, and there's a revised heart allocation score that's coming out, because the concept is, is these VAD patients are doing pretty well to, 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 to take 30-day discretion and put them higher on the list as 1B compared to status 2. But it does go to show that for patients that are, that are dying of heart failure and you want to keep them alive uh, and, and functionally uh, well, LVAD's uh, an, ex an extremely um, important um, strategy. When you look at more contemporary data, survivorship to transplant, is in excess of uh, uh, 85%. These tend to be patients that have fewer comorbidities compared to those with destination therapy. And so 88% alive at one year when you're considering uh, transplanted alive or recovery. Recovery is a free, low frequent phenomena. By, by Intermax, uh, typically less than one to two percent of all patients will have true recovery where you can take the LVAD out and, and not have need the transplant and they do well for, for several years. Um, but that field continues to evolve. So really, for at our institution and across the country, destination therapy as a strategy is increasing. Ours is, is in excess of 65% of all our patients. We have 130 LVAD patients that we monitor in clinic. 65% are the LVAD for life. And when you look at uh, Intermax and, and, and registry data, um, certainly now over 40% across the country, where it had been in its infancy in 2006 to 9, less than uh, 10%. And when you look specifically at destination therapy um, um, survivorship, it's currently in the range between 75 to 81 percent. And what we've learned is that those patients that are less sick going into an LVAD are, are doing better. And these are the patients that are not in particular uh, onotrope dependent or crashing and burning. That's the Intermax 3, 2, and 1. But the Intermax 4 patients that have advanced heart failure features going in for more elective LVAD have survivorship as, as high as 81% uh, uh, at one year. And we know, especially as you transition into less sick patients, it's not all about living longer, it's quality of life. And, and when, you, when you look at visual log analog scales that capture patient reports of how they feel and what they're able to do in terms of self-care, um, LVADs associated out to two years with improvement in, in quality of life. And this holds true independent of the Intermax profile, one through three, four, four through seven. Um, and, and so I think that's key. Now, again, you're balancing out projected benefit with risk and the adverse event rates I will review. There is some data to say they're on the, there is some data to, to uh, suggest that overall uh, adverse events are on the downward trend. The ones we worry about are stroke, uh, prevalence up to about as high as 10%, uh, driveline related infection prevalence about 25% at, at one year. But there's morbidity related to G, GI bleeding that we can see in one in three patients. Um, out to uh, a year to name uh, a few. And so understanding that projected benefit and risk is key. And we've hopefully uh, highlighted this several times as it relates to those with more overt shock. Um, Intermax 1 don't do uh, as well perioperatively. And that's exemplified in uh, Dr. Boyle's initial observations back in 2011, whether uh, perioperative and one, two year survivorship, that's the Intermax 1 versus those less sick but advanced heart failure patients, four through seven do better. So I showed this when I talked about optimization strategies for shock, contraindications to permanent LVAD, severe hemodynamic instability, but keep in mind the others. Those with significant right heart failure that's pre-existing, you're going to assist the left ventricle. You may have 
uh, significant problems with the right ventricle. And so we do a lot of um, um, optimization, modeling, and to try to predict uh, RV failure. That's a talk in and of itself. But patients with uncertain neurologic status on prolonged ventil ventilation, a vasodilatory syndrome, these are patients you don't want to take for uh, a major thoracic surgery with a sternotomy. And so you really want to optimize them to improve their, their candidacy. Now I'm going to transition in terms of decision making and observations in patients you may see in clinic that are short of breath, at rest, or with light exertion despite guideline medical therapy, ejection fraction, for example, less than 30% on guideline-directed therapy. When you look at the medical arm of Intermax, 12-month event-free survival in these this type of patient is 56%. So even though they're ambulatory, those with high-grade symptoms and other features, hospitalization, poor functional capacity, may not do, do as well as you, you would hope. And in particularly, just looking at breathlessness at rest, event-free survival at 12, mo 12 months, only 28%. So three out of four people will die um, with, 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 uh, with these advanced heart failure features. So we were very interested from a multi-center uh, uh, perspective study per uh, standpoint on understanding the relative benefits and risks of pursuing LVAD in, in Intermax four through seven patients versus optimal medical management, recognizing that all LVADs, 80% are implanted in patients in Intermax 1, crashing and burning, 2, failing onotropes, or 3, onotrope dependent, where the field's moving is you know, mainly 2s and 3s. About 20% based on Intermax are implanted in patients that have advanced heart failure features but not onotrope dependent. That's the 4 through 6. And so this was a prospective multi-center, non-randomized, it was an observational study with a primary aim to evaluate and compare effectiveness of LVAD versus optimal medical management in patients that met the FDA indication uh, for destination therapy. And that was shortness of breath with minimal exertion or at rest, 3B or 4, EF less than 25%, contraindications for heart transplant, and failing optimal medical management. And remember these two features, at least one hospitalization over the last year or a six-minute walk distance less than 300 meters. Dr. Guha mentions 300 meters as a cutoff right in terms of prognosticating pulmonary hypertension, 300 meters based on Metamax, based on Romap, is a cutoff that's resurfacing. Well, these patients typically don't do as well. And looked at key secondary endpoints related to uh, quality of life. And again, non-randomized, and it is true that in the 97 re that received LVAD versus optimal medical management, and this was at the discretion of those 41 centers, um, the LVAD cohort reflective here, baseline characteristics were, were similar, but the LVAD patients were more sick, if you will, with a greater New York Heart Class 4 percentage, um, a greater percentage of Intermax, Intermax Profile 4, and there were trends towards more compromised six-minute walk. But these patients were telling us they felt worse by visual analog scale and had a higher depression screen. We know that overlap between depression and heart failure is certainly uh, real. And, and these patients that received LVAD were, were not satisfied with their quality of life. That's the 79% the red compared to 21% in LVAD, more split down the middle in the optimal medical management. But when you look at the primary endpoint of, of this uh, publication from the fall of last year in Jack, those that received LVAD, again, in, uh, based upon the primary endpoint, more were alive at 12 months on original therapy with an increase in six minute walk distance by 75 meters, pre-specified, compared to OMM. This was largely driven by the use of delayed LVAD in the optimal medical management, but compare the green and red with an odds ratio of 2.4. And events-free survival, 80% um, those that received an LVAD compared to uh, OMM of only 64%. Perioperative mortality was very low, lowest of that reported in, in any uh, uh, trial with LVADs at only 1%. Um, percent. And important metrics related to quality of life the LVAD, what it does a good job with is, is heart failure remission, and the majority, 77% on LVAD, uh, had a resolution of their significant symptoms compared to the minority that had continued optimal medical management. And in terms of uh, alive at 12 months and improvement in New York heart class, um, overall quality of life and depression screens, green versus red LVAD compared to optimal medical management in favor of, of LVAD. But the adverse event profile, to be very honest, is not where, where we want it. And there were more adverse events in those that received LVAD, namely GI bleeding, drive line infection, pump thrombosis intrinsic to the device. But stroke prevalence was a little higher compared to optimal medical management. And worsening heart failure, as you would anticipate, was more prevalent in optimal medical management. But both arms had frequent rehospitalizations. So after an LVAD, 
you, the majority are going to have a hospitalization at least once over the ensuing post-implant 12 months. And so the composite event rate was in favor of optimal medical management. So the aim of this trial is not to say do LVAD or pursue medicines in advanced heart failure patients that are ambulatory. It's the way the risks and benefits, keep it in mind, uh, 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 survival as treated, quality of life, and what the patient's telling you. And so we use that uh, in part with the use of the decision aid to inform our patients, to guide them, so we can make a decision on whether an LVAD is right for that particular patient. So in summary, um, continuous LVADs really have changed um, what we have available to treat these patients, many of which are, are plagued with end-stage heart failure and dying. Implants now exceed over 2,000 implants per year. While inotrope dependency, at least inotrope dependency, defines the threshold for VAT therapy, I think that's uh, going to move, especially as technology improves and the adverse event rate is lowered. Re remember, survivor, sur actual aerial survival is now at about 80% all comers, and important improvements in quality of life and destination therapy is a, a growing strategy that helps us help many of our patients. So with that, um, I appreciate your attention, and we will transition to the next the real next talk by Dr. Bimraj. Thank you.